Uh, thank you so much. Uh, my name is Jamie Falkenberry. I'm with Lieutenant Governor's Office. And as many of you know, when the Lieutenant Governor was running for our office, uh, his big platform was education. And what he's always said is we're in a time and age where we can customize curriculum to each individual student. We're able to uh, take out the strengths of, the, of each student, uh, maximize those, and then look at their weaknesses and try to figure out a way or a platform to help them better their career. And he's really big on mastery-based education. And when we came into office, Lieutenant Governor, uh, one of the first meetings that we ever had was about this e-learning commission. And the e-learning commission was, uh, was an executive order by then Governor Bev Perdue. And it was to uh, transition to a digital age with our K-12 and all the way actually K-20 um, education system. But when we came to office, we, we found that there were some budget constraints with how this e-learning commission was gonna come about. And as many of you know, uh, to get things done in Raleigh, sometimes you need a law to get passed. And fortunately, uh, we worked with the General Assembly to really work on how to customize this education. And what we started off with was the, uh, as you can see, transition from funding textbooks to funding digital materials. Uh, as the Lieutenant Governor always says, if you get that device into each kid's hands, they, that opens up the entire world of every single book, every single piece of information out there, so that you can, again, customize the curriculum to each of their needs and uh, to what's best suited for them. And then what we said is, oh, well, we have, we're probably most aligned uh, in the entire nation to be the first state in the union to have each one of our classrooms uh, with broadband internet. Uh, thanks to the work that's been done for the last 20 years in the government with uh, the likes of MCNC, we have a pipeline that goes through every single uh, LEA or school district as we call them in North Carolina. The only problem is, is that once it gets to the school district, it varied very differently on who actually had access in the classroom by the school district, even by the school, even by the classroom itself. So we wanted to do a digital plan that really maximized and said, all right, let's get a plan out there to figure out what is inside every single classroom so we know. Because we've seen what some school districts do in that they, they buy a bunch of devices and think, all right, well, this is going to cure all of our ills. Well, no, so we've even heard some reports of school districts where they've plugged in the devices and they've literally blown up and gotten caught on fire. So we said each, state, each school district is in a very different position. Let's see what we have out there. Let's construct a digital plan so that we know how to spend our resources more adequately rather than just throwing money at, at the issue. Um, I'll talk about more at the end about how we all, how this all sinks in together, but now that we're at this plan, the Friday Institute has done a lot of work on figuring out the what. And that is where Dr. Korn's gonna come up here and explain what have we found throughout the digital plan. Thank you, Jamie. And it's been a real pleasure to work with Lieutenant Governor's Office, um, with the State Board of Education, with the Department of Public Instruction, mem members of our legislature. I see uh, Greg Sanders is here representing the House, so thank you for attending today. Um, just like Jamie said, so we had this, these um, statutes that were passed in the previous, um, the previous um, last year's legislation. So in the Friday Institute, and I don't know how many of you are familiar with the Friday Institute, we're part of the College of Education. We're a research institute really focused on innovations in schools. All of our work <laughs> focuses on doing research and professional development, evaluation, um, and policy, examining policies, how it relates to innovations in K-12 and community college spaces. Um, we do a lot of convenings, we do a lot of discussions, really trying to make sure that the data that we're collecting is being fed back to the policymakers um, so that they can make informed decisions based on the realities of schools. So as we were beginning this work, we realized one of the kind of core pieces to get things started is, is we needed to talk about the why, the why of digital learning. Um, and as we engaged with stakeholders at every single level, what we found is a set of outcomes, a set of why, why we needed to even think about digital learning for schools in North Carolina. Um, one of them, Jamie mentioned earlier, that the Lieutenant Governor is very interested in is this idea of mastery and competency-based learning, not just for our teachers, but for our students. Um, so this is the idea that you should let kids move at their own pace, that when they master a concept that they're ready to move on to the next one. It's really about individualizing and personalizing, personalizing learning for students um, 
across across the board, meeting them where they are, um, that digital tools and digital devices give us an opportunity to do just that. And again, not just for our students, but also for our teachers. Thinking about ways we can reconceptualize the idea of CEUs. It shouldn't be the number of hours a teacher necessarily takes professional development. What you want them is to master a new concept with instruction, to learn a new tool, and then be able to apply that in their classroom. Also, this idea of anywhere, anytime learning. Something that, you know, I think was actually written up in the NNO just yesterday was how the Wake County Public School System is butting up against some of the restrictive policies about seat time for kids. What digital devices do is give us an opportunity to think about, well, if there is a snow day, there really continues to be an opportunity if there's equal access to those devices and content for learning to go on no matter where we are. It's not restricting us just to that 8, 8, to 8 a.m. to 3 p.m. time any longer. Personalizing the learning. Having access, as all of us do, to, um, to digital in to information on the internet and as we're connecting with communities across the globe, really making learning personalized to our interests, really it fosters that, that idea of a lifelong learner. Student-centered instruction, this notion of how can we think about giving kids opportunities to work in groups, um, to drive their own learning, to help set their own learning goals. Really thinking about how digital age teaching and learning shifts the models for the classroom. Providing interactive, flexible, vetted content that every child and every teacher in the state has access to. This idea of assessments integrated into learning activities. One of the um, one of the, the best ideas in education is that we give teachers access to data in real time so that they can make instructional decisions for their kids where they are. And digital devices and digital content and interactive assessments are the way to actually make that happen. It's been a dream for a long, long time. Not assessing lots and lots of assessments at the end of the year where the teachers don't can't use that data, but really figuring out ways that we can use and in, to utilize that assessment data in, in an ongoing way. I think parent portals is a key component of this work too, getting our parents more involved in the academic life of their children, giving them more information, digital devices, access to the content, access to the assessments that their kids are actually using in the classroom. This really provides a great way to engage parents and the broader community in exactly what's going on in schools. It really forces us to be much more transparent, I think, about that. And then finally, this idea of project-based and community-based learning activities that are connected to students' lives outside of school. Really thinking about how we can engage, do real-world projects, engage in real community activities um, with our students inside of the classroom. Some of the guiding principles that the Friday Institute identified as we were working on this plan were really focused on this idea of effective teaching and learning enhanced by technology, not where the technology comes first. Leveraging existing innovations and expertise. As you all know, there are some amazing things going on in schools, in you know, schools in every single district in this state. So how can we take that and build on it and share what's working and what's not working across the state? Developing leadership capacity, um, something that you'll hear in you know, as with every major successful initiative as it starts with both the school and the district leadership, giving them the tools that they need to support the teachers and the students in their schools. Engaging teachers and administrators, students and parents, business leaders, and other stakeholders in the development of the plan. I'll talk a little bit about how we've done that over the past 18 months. Focusing on equity of educational opportunities for all students. Something that we see even within a single district is a huge continuum from where kids have, some kids have access, some schools have great resources, some less so. How can we really ensure as, as North Carolinians that we're providing an equal opportunity for access to all of these great educational resources, to great teachers and great leaders? And then really thinking about a long-term plan, um, thinking about sustainability. What are new funding models that we could think of? How can we share, share that responsibility from the local and at the state level? And thinking also about educational return on investment. This slide really talks about the methodological approach we've used at the Friday Institute in partnership with many of our education stakeholders over the past 18 months. 
we really tried to focus on um, not just the digital learning needs of the schools and districts around the state, but again, that idea of what assets already exist and how can we leverage them. We really spent a lot of time, the first kind of three or four months we were working on this, kind of combing through all of the data we already had access to. Rather than going out and collecting new data, we really tried to organize and figure out what data do we already have um, through work we have done on uh, various evaluations, through partnerships with the department, through partnerships with um, school districts across the state. And then we realized there were some key, and we realized we had a lot of quantitative data, a lot of survey data, a lot of, you know, a, end of course data but what we really needed to do was get out on the ground and talk to people we needed to collect a lot of qualitative data to get some of those rich stories from districts around the state so we organized our work in these kind of four buckets these four circles one was focused on human capacity so what what did teachers and leaders what sort of professional development did they need what sort of personnel needed to be in a school to really make sure that a transition to digital learning could take place content and instruction what content needed to be in place what would what do, do new instructional practice looks like look like technology infrastructure and devices that is a critical component when you're out talking to teachers if the devices don't work if they can't connect to the internet it's the I entire initiative is a, you know is at a stop before you even get started and then there's some real questions some real deep questions that we needed to ask about funding and policy about what were new funding models what were some of the policies that needed to be in place both at the state and the local level and then right now we're what we're presenting to the state board tomorrow or Wednesday is this notion about the digital learning plan we're providing recommendations to the state board about what needs to be put in place over the next five ten ten years so over the past 18 months, we have been out in the field. We have done over 78 presentations to stakeholders from around, the, m much like this, sharing information about the digital learning plan, collecting data while we're on site. We've done 18 deep dive site visits all over the state. We've conducted 166 interviews and focus groups. We had a huge digital learning plan advisory board that, is, that continues to be intact and we'll continue to work with. We had 74 external working team advisors that would come to the Friday Institute that would give us advice and help us look through the data, help us with data interpretation. We had 25 staff at the Friday Institute at any given time working on this. This was a big, big project. And we also had districts 100% participation. 115 districts filled out a rubric to let us know that where they were with digital learning right now and 120 of our 146 charter schools. This is where we did our deep dive site visits. We also did site visits to charter schools. But you see, we really tried to get a good mix, urban and rural, um, large. Folks that had spent, Green County has been working on digital learning for 10 years already. They are absolutely one of the leaders in our state. East and West really tried to get some diversity. So now we're going to talk a little bit about some of the selected findings. I'm going to go through a first, the first couple, and then Dr. Stallings is going to come up and um, bring us home. Um, so one of the first data sources we wanted to talk a little bit about, and one of the first pieces that we looked through as we were starting this work, was the Teacher Working Conditions Survey. So this is a survey that goes out to every teacher in the state of North Carolina every other year. It has about an 80 or 90 percent response rate every other year. So it's a pretty robust survey. It's gone back for a number of years. It's been in place. And there was, this is just one example of some of the data we were looking at. So the top picture, and it's the important part here to see is not to dig into each individual district, but from a state level perspective. You can see one of the items that we asked is teachers have access to instructional technology. And so the the districts are colored in by the percent of teachers that agreed or strongly agreed to that. So the darker the blue, the more teachers that agreed or strongly agreed that they have access to instructional technology, including computers, printers, software. And then the picture below is saying that they have access to sufficient training, right? And you see that the state on the bottom is lighter blue. So what that tells us, just in a quick snapshot, from 80 to 90 percent of our teachers across the state is that they feel like in many places they do have access to the instructional technology but they have not been adequately trained on how to use it. So as we begin thinking about what were some of the priorities for the digital learning plan, professional development for our teachers was one that we identified based on existing data. 
This is data from the annual media and technology report. Um, this is the 2015 data, hot off the press. Um, so as of June 2015, um, 688 North Carolina schools have a one-to-one -one initiative. So that means one laptop or one device for every teacher and student in that school. There are about 2,500 schools in our state. So what this tells us is that the districts are moving this forward. There are innovations and a lot we can learn from these schools that, have, that are already implementing a digital learning environment in their classrooms. So looking, digging in a little bit deeper, you see 91 LEAs have at least one one-to-one -one school. 10 LEAs in our state are one-to-one -one in all of their schools. They have been working really hard for a long time to get professional development and the leadership ready to go and teachers transition to, um, to a fully one-to-one -one environment. Um, but that what this at the bottom, this idea about this is gonna really increase the amount of connectivity that all of our schools need. As we move to a digital environment where there's more and more devices on the infrastructure, the increase, there's gonna be a growing connectivity demands. This is again some new data for folks, um, 2015 AMTR. Um, our districts and schools tell us that about 16% of our schools have a full-time instructional technology facilitator assigned to that school. About a little bit more than 80% have a full-time media coordinator and a technician doing that more technical support pieces is a little bit more than 10%. When we look at the research for a successful one-to-one -one initiative or successful school that has transitioned to digital learning, they talk about the, the collective work of these three roles. That there needs to be somebody providing technical support, there needs to be somebody providing instructional support, and the media coordinator tends to be more focused on the students. I think in North Carolina what this allows us to do is start to think about new strategic staffing models, new roles for media coordinators in our, in our schools as they're moving to a one-to-one, -one, as they're kind of transitioning to digital learning. I think the next slide is Tripp's, um, is Tripp's not talking again about some more AMTR data. You saw earlier that uh, Dr. Korn noted that we had done 78 presentations across the state. I think that collectively, either together or separately, she and I have done about 50 of those. These presentations are still a work in progress, and you actually are the first to see uh, these types of data. So you'll have to help us understand whether or not this gets the message across. It's a pretty important slide, but it's not really easy to read yet, so we would appreciate your feedback. One of the questions on the AMTR survey asks schools to identify or estimate how many of their students have home access. Now, it's an estimation, so it's hard to tell, but we split this into four different segments of schools. Schools, about a third of the schools in which most of their students have access. The blue bar, a little bit of red where they don't. Almost half of the schools where it's about half to a little bit more of the students have access. And then several schools where the majority of students don't have access. Now, this should come as no surprise. I think we all know that access across the state is variable. The reason we split it up, though, is because sometimes it gets lost in the numbers if we say that 70% of all students have access. But what's really important is that's not <coughs> consistent across schools. We have several schools where most students do not, and many schools where most do. This was one of the other pieces of data that we pulled out from uh, looking at the data for uh, the past couple of years. Jenny mentioned uh, the digital learning progress rubric and the fact that we were fortunate to have every district in the state and nearly every charter school fill it out. There's too much to read up here, but uh, you can take a look later at all the different areas we asked them about. We also mentioned, too, that digital learning is more than just about devices. And I think the rubric helps to point that out. There are, is it 30 or 25? There's 25? 25 different elements here that point out to the districts, where do you need to be thinking about as you prepare to make this transition to digital learning? We have a couple of districts who were thinking exclusively about devices. There's a lot more to think about. And what they did by doing this self-assessment, and again it's self-assessment data, was to start thinking through all the areas in which they already have strengths and then the areas in which they're going to need to do more work. The other thing that the rubric allows us to do is to customize the digital learning transition. So rather than having a one-size-fits-all, everybody gets the same program approach, a top-down approach, this is a bottom-up approach to transitioning to digital learning. Lenore County, where are you right now? What's your target for moving forward? 
Clay County, where are you? What's your target for moving forward? Lexington City, the same thing. It's an important aspect of the process to make sure that what we're doing is tailoring the needs to the different LEAs. And here's where they are. For those counties who are white or red, these are districts that in their self-assessment said, you know what, based on what we've just read going through this rubric together, we're early in this process. And it was good for them to see that and to acknowledge that and also to have a place to start moving forward. Those districts that are in the light blue to darker blue, those were the districts that said, you know what, we think we're making pretty good progress based on what we're seeing here in the rubric. Now we may not agree with them exactly on their own interpretations of where they are, but it's an important first step to have them start to do that. And what we've heard from them too is it's been a great opportunity for them to be able to talk about longer range strategic planning as a result of having this data in front of them. Some of the things in which they rated themselves the most, uh, the highest, communication collaboration across schools within schools, school networks, which uh, is a, a point of pride for North Carolina, simply because as uh, Dr. Korn mentioned, we have, and I think Jamie did too, we've, we've wired every school. There's, there's a pipe to every school in the state. There's not wiring necessarily within every school, but we've done a pretty good job. This is a, a national leader here to have so many state, to have, have so many schools connected. Schools already making transition to authentic assessment, something we talked about earlier is one of the eight keys to digital learning. Uh, the policies, actually there's more, there's more appropriate policies in place in this state for this transition than, than I suspected going in. I was very pleased to see that and it looks like the LEAs have agreed with us. And also we see that we are moving towards more schools and more classrooms with end user devices. Areas in which the districts are less confident going forward and number one should be no surprise, sustainability. Just about every digital learning uh, initiative in the state to this point has been funded by one-time money. Once you get it, you do what you can with it, but there's no guarantee that it's going to be there later. Sustainability is always on their minds. If what they have to do is to get a grant every five years to renew devices, and believe me, the devices don't last that long. <laughs> We've got some districts, so we think the shelf life is typically about three to four years. We have some districts that are stretching them eight to nine years right now because of this right here. So one of the things we want to point out as we continue to present about the plan is how important it is to help the districts figure out ways to do this funding going forward in a way that they can count on for years to come. Also up here, as I mentioned earlier, they're very aware of how little access some of them have outside of school for their students. Now there's ways to work around that, but as we transition to all digital learning, we're going to have to find ways to, to bring that number up. Uh, supporting services, the role of the educator, these are the things that a lot of the districts are saying they're going to have to explore and learn more about as we move forward. So what did we find on the deep dive district visits? Like I just said, the digital learning supports have to be targeted to local context. We can't do a one size fits all program and I think that most folks are aware of that and most of them are on board for that and that's one of the messages we'll be delivering to the state board on Wednesday. Leading digital learning transitions is different from leading traditional learning transitions. If our leaders aren't prepared to do this, our teachers and our students may be ready to go in one direction and the leadership may not be there to follow them or to even show them the way. It's an important first key step for us is to make sure that our leadership is brought up to speed as quickly as possible. Home base. Home base is uh, loved and maligned depending on who you ask. We've actually decided through the end of this process that it's probably a pretty good platform for us to continue to use going forward. There are lots of things that are going to need to be changed about it to make it more effective going forward. However, it's a place to start. Our teachers are aware of the potential that it has and part of the plan addresses how to make home base, we've been referring to it as home base 2.0, how to make it the tool that everybody wants it and needs it to be. Already, as we already know, many teachers are already in the process of using internet, uh, resources, other digital resources in a relatively haphazard way. Some of them use it very well, some of them are getting whatever they can. Part of the process of the digital learning plan is to help sort of uh, to stabilize and to improve the curation and quality of the materials that they're already starting to use. We are already recognized as a national leader in broadband internet access to schools. This is one of the first key points that helped us to realize that yes, and I think you mentioned this Jamie, if the plan is implemented fully, we can lead the nation in digital learning. And it's not just a, a, a platitude, it's really the truth after we've been out there and seen what's going on. We really think that that's a, an honest outcome for us. And last but not least, as we said several times, funding is going to continue to be an issue, not because there's necessarily always you need to have money coming in, but we have to have sustainable resources that are going to be able to con keep continue this work going forward. We've had a lot of help with that over the years at the le with the legislature changing a lot of the funding rules so that there's more flexibility where the funding that goes to schools can go out to, and that's going to be a pretty big help with that. So in January, 
we wanted to present to the legislature some, uh, some initial findings, things that we might be working on ahead of time. The digital learning plan is not going to happen overnight. So 2017, we're not going to be able to flip a big switch and suddenly everybody's online. The digital learning plan is going to evolve at each district at a different pace over several years. Getting to that point also requires some work. So what we did was we tried to, to put out there some of the changes we could work on between now and 2017 that would get this state more ready for that transition. And we presented those in January. You will be the last group we present to on this because we actually have the plan tomorrow <laughs> or Wednesday. Uh, but I wanted to show you some of the things that we thought the state could go ahead and start transitioning toward over the next couple of years. And we put some prices on them. One of which is to move from just connecting the schools to connecting uh, the classrooms themselves. We actually know exactly what that costs. Uh, we're able to leverage, I think, $34 million in federal E-rate matching funds, which brings the cost of doing that down from 50-some million to 12 million to get all the school classrooms wired. And that's an ongoing cost because of the maintenance issues, but because of federal E-rate, it's much less expensive than it would be if we just did it on our own. We've talked a lot about establishing a collaborative procurement service. This seems pretty boring, but it's actually really important. This state is exceptionally good at getting really good rates on textbooks. We need to get really good rates on devices and on the material. One way to do that is if we told everybody what device to use. That would run counter to the way the plan works. What we'd rather do is recommend device criteria and then help the different districts figure out which of them are buying the same devices and helping them get those devices in bulk. The same with materials as well. Developing a collaborative procurement service, which is somewhere between one district buying what it needs and the entire state buying what it needs, is the way to go for us on that. We also know that addressing the broadband access issue is not a school only issue. It's a public safety issue. It's a health issue. It's a business issue, and we're already seeing movement here on getting a full statewide effort to think about what the state can do to increase the opportunities for Internet access. Uh, we've talked about establishing a grants program. As, as Dr. Korn mentioned, there's so many good things already happening in the state. We need to find more ways to share that to let some of those districts bring in other districts, show them what they're doing, take out on the road some of the things they're doing, and also get creative and help lead the way for us in figuring out what it is that we need to do. Uh, professional learning for digital learning leaders, I've already mentioned, is an important thing that we thought we should begin before the plan itself, moving to home base 2.0, beginning the process of expanding our resources, um, beginning the transition to digital education resource adoption. I think the most fascinating meetings I've had over the last year have been with the Textbook Commission, which is uh, inscribed in statute, how it works, it operates. Every five years, we, we review the textbooks for a given subject. And guess what? That is hardly applicable in a digital learning environment where the information is changing daily. We've already engaged with that group and others to start thinking about what it means to evaluate digital learning materials. Regional support. Again, this should not be just a top-down plan. This should be something that accommodates not only the individual schools, the LEAs, but also to help the regions figure out how to move forward so that the, the, the help that they get and the leadership that they have is focused on the needs of that particular region. And then, of course, there will be some state level management. How did we do? Well, we actually showed up in some of the budget projections from June. So the House had included uh, funding for several of these items. Uh, the Textbook Commission can already begin to do their work on the transition to digital age. Uh, resources. The Office of Digital Infrastructure is already working on creating the broadband plan. We didn't expect everything to go through, but it was good to see, and we hope to see over the next couple of weeks as the House and Senate come together that some of these building blocks for transitioning into digital learning will make it through for this session. Okay, last thoughts. I said it earlier, I really do mean it. I think after working on this for 18 months, I really do believe that this state can become a national leader in digital learning. We've got the right people, the right devices, the right ideas, the right concepts, the right leadership, and the right attitude. I think we've got a good shot at this. We do believe there's good long-term uh, return for the state in terms of educational outcomes. We want to continue to see that graduation rate increase. And workforce preparation, I'll cycle back to something Dr. Corn mentioned earlier, the more we move towards authentic learning and integrating what's happening outside of school with what's in school, the better we're going to have our workforce prepared. Uh, we also do believe the Digital Learning Initiative is going to move things in the right direction, but changes will be ongoing. Again, as I said, it's not going to be a simple matter of making a conversion come September 2017. It will be an ongoing, growing process as we learn how to be learners in this new environment. 
And as we've continued to reiterate with a lot of people, including our districts, many of whom thought that the whole goal was to get a laptop in a kid's hands, it's more than that. To do this right, we're going to have to continue to invest in the infrastructure, the digital content, the human capacity development, and those devices to make this a success. If you'd like to follow along with all the different things that we have posted about this, our website is here, our contact information is here. You can find presentations like this, uh, the January policy brief. We will also have up the, the first run of the plan itself sometime this week, I think, and our initial uh, uh, brief that explained the work that we were going to do. And that should be, uh, I think it's all available there on the one site. Is that right? And Jamie, I'll turn it back over to you to close this out. Trip, uh, Dr. Stallings touched on the majority of what we were looking for, but I, uh, we're very confident that we're going to get the $12 million, as was said in a couple slides before, that uh, goes towards the infrastructure that we can leverage with the E-rates. Uh, fortunately, we were able to get $5 million this year from Race to the Top money to go towards the $12 million that we need. So really, we only need $7 million this year. So we're leveraging federal money with state money to get more federal money. Uh, love how that always works out. And then next year, we will need $12 million recurring. But uh, if, if this plan is done well, as Dr. Corner and Dr. Stalling said, uh, this will bridge that socioeconomic divide that has troubled our state for, for so many years, where we're trying to get equity in every single LEA. Uh, you always hear that the, the big school districts, whether it's your, your Wake, your Charlotte Mech, your Guilford, uh, and then you, you, we always um, have the mountains and the coast that don't have the, the many resources that we have. But if we have this set in place in the next three to five years, we will have the opportunity to get the best teachers and the best instructors into every classroom around the, around the state. This is already being done through the Science of School of Math. The Lieutenant Governor and I had a great tour there a couple months ago where there were kids um, that were from Pasquatank. Did I say that right? Pasquatank. Oh, screw that. Pasquatank in the far uh, northeast, and then there was one uh, student in Clay County, and there were other students all scattered out, all taking college-level calculus uh, as a high school student. And there was actually one eighth grader in there too, which goes back to the mastery-based education. If we're able to give these opportunities to every single student, no matter what area they are in the state, this will bridge that socioeconomic divide that has been in our state um, for many years. But now we have ways to combat this. And we're very excited. Something I forgot to mention, I should have mentioned at the beginning, the reason why Lieutenant Governor is in this role right now is from the session law that was passed, uh, this got put in the State Board of Education, and they've actually made a special committee called the Digital Learning, uh, Digital Learning Special Committee, and we've been working hand in hand with the Friday Institute. Obviously, they have a lot bigger staff than uh, the Lieutenant Governor staff of four people, uh, but we've worked hand in hand with them to make sure that these goals happen. And in fact, when they uh, first came up with their plan, they said, to realistically do this, we're gonna shoot for, is it 2018, 2019? And Lieutenant Governor sat in that meeting and said, technology is happening way too rapid. We need to get this plan in the next two years. Let's try to at least shoot for this in 2017. So that's why you see all those goals. And what Dr. Stalling said is, yes, it, we're not going to just flip on the switch in 2017. A lot of, a lot of school districts are well beyond this, and we got to work with a lot of others. But we are going in that right direction where we will be a model for the entire, uh, entire nation. And uh, with that, I think we're going to start taking questions from everybody. Or how did you want to do that? Sure. Anything technical just goes right to Dr. Korn. looking at me? No, uh, <laughs> go I'll, ahead. You I'm say it, I'll say something it. after that. All three of us can do yeah. it. I love that. I think absolutely. I think a lot of it has to do with making sure that both the companies that we're working with, um, that the devices that are selected match, you know, the capacity for and the needs, local, the local digital learning and needs, which I think like that collaborative procurement question is why we've made that recommendation to make sure that devices and companies that we're partnered with as a state um, 
have some opportunities to get some of that vetting through the RFP process, maybe in a way that uh, at a local level they don't have the capacity, they don't maybe don't know the right questions to ask sometimes. Can I add one real quick? Yeah, then I'll, I'll say One of the things the plan is going to include is we don't want to tell, like I said earlier, we don't want to tell a school what device to buy, but we do have uh, pretty strict guidelines and recommendations for what devices will work. What are the yeah. things that are going to work? So we'd like to, to narrow down the number of times that a district gets uh, money all of a sudden and says, I want to go out and buy a bunch of iPads because I think they're pretty cool. We want them to think first about whether or not that's the right device for, for its use. For instance, uh, I'll mention two districts and won't call them by name, but one of them has integrated iPads into its elementary school classrooms in a really great way. Another one has not, has purchased uh, iPads and just distributed them willy-nilly, and that's been part of the issue too. So in addition to making sure that they are buying devices that are going to function, it's also helping them make good choices about which devices they need for their particular needs. And I think what the digital plan ultimately is going to be is like what they both said, it's going to be a game plan and a roadmap for them to get there. It's not just going to be, all right, digital plans here and I'll do it. I mean, the device is going to be, should be the last step in this entire process. You need to have the infrastructure set up, then you need to have the support, then you need to train your teachers. Then, as you saw, we only have 16% of uh, digital technology coordinators in classrooms right now. So. It's great when you get these federal grants and other grants and say, all right, start buying all the devices, but if you don't have the support to back this all up, then, you, then you're basically at square one when you try to skip to uh, step seven. They've heard it all before, right? This is the, the words we use are the same words they've heard for 20, 30 years. Um, w one of the differences this time is that they they don't necessarily have a choice. That this is going to catch up with them. Not necessarily our plan, but the idea that digital is going to be a part of their of their classroom world. So, in, in rather than just saying trust us, let's go along for the ride and make sure this works, we're telling them this is something that's going to happen. You're already seeing it happen in a lot of your schools. Let's help you figure out how to do it better. Uh, to begin with. We have heard some resistance from some folks early on, but the longer that they work with us and talk to us, the more they start to get on board with this. Um, you you want to, you have some experience from the field on that one? I, as a matter of fact, I do. So we, um, I was actually over in Wake County, as you guys know, they're doing that BYOD, uh, bring your own device pilot. And I was over at an elementary school in Wake County and the assistant principal was telling me that they basically just said whoever wants to try this in your elementary classroom we will let you try and he said that it, you know it works out to about a, a third of the teacher a quarter of the teachers mm -hmm. are gung-ho they are ready to go they'll try they'll try it and then there's about a quarter that are absolute resistors not in my classroom that is not going to happen in my classroom and then there's a 50 percent that'll are waiting to see how it goes for that first quarter um, and that the assistant principal told me in particular he had one teacher that was about to retire and was like I'm not trying anything new in my classroom and that once she saw the difference that it made for the teacher down the hall for the the other kids that would be talking about what was going on in so-and-so miss so-and-so's classroom that it gave her an opportunity to try it in a safe way I think that that's something to learn together from a peer um, so she then she started doing baby steps and by the end of the year was one of the biggest advocates for the program for for what it did in her own classroom but John I definitely think that's something that we struggle with all the time which is why it's so critical for to give principals and district leaders an opportunity to have conversations with their teachers about the why about what it's going to take to make that change in a school um, and give them the information that they need to have those very honest conversations with their teachers and give them the freedom to fail as it's getting started and learn from one another from their peers
So actually, I've got a, another study separate and apart from this going on right now about uh, online learning for credit recovery and helping uh, to bridge the gap for kids who are falling behind and failing. And there's already a, a use of, of uh, I think, seven or eight different, well, a lot of different ones, but seven or eight in particular, Khan Academy is one of them, is used pretty widespread across the, uh, the state. Uh, one of the best things about having that happen is that because of the, the high amount of usage, we're starting to see improvements in the quality of what's happening with the Khan Academy work. Because uh, I don't want to single them out, but a lot of these groups put things online before they were ready. Khan Academies weren't exactly great to start, but they're much stronger now. And it's a pretty common thing to see that as a tool for helping students uh, progress uh, who are behind or get ahead. Uh, but we also have, of course, our own state resource, which is the virtual public school, as well as a lot of other groups that are coming in. Part of our being able to do this as a state is that we're going to help to dictate the market for that kind of material, too. And that's an important position for us to be in so that the things that these producers are starting to make and to provide fit better for our needs since we will be the largest kid on the block. And the only thing I'll add to that is that um, some of our research partners, um, SRI, is actually doing an evaluation of Khan Academy for, um, I don't know, maybe from U.S. Department of Education, because they were asking nationally, who's using this? Is it working? Is it having a positive impact on student learning? And I don't think they've released any of the reports yet, but that would ab that's absolutely both a group that, that we're connected with to learn about that national research perspective, and then someone like yourself that's interested in that, that's a group that's doing that work. So I had the uh, inestimable <laughs> task of doing the funding. <laughs> I often say that at, at the Friday Institute, my job is to look at the people who come up with the ideas and do this. <laughs> nope. <laughs> um, we anticipate that there will be uh, some upfront higher costs as we started to calculate out. And we don't know what the curve is going to look like as it tails off. But part of the transition is transitioning, just like you've said, from putting money into some things and moving it over to others. So at first, there's probably going to be some overlap. And there will be a bump on the funding. And uh, uh, Phil Emer, who's our director of technology, is that what this title is? He and I have been working on what those numbers might look like. We have a pretty good sense. Uh, I'm not sure we're going to present those to the board this week, but we will have those out pretty soon about what it'll look like. But both he and I think that as we start to see the districts make that transition, there will be less of that redundancy. And you'll see that, that initial cost start to tail off as things get transitioned from one mode of spending to another. A, a good example was what Dr. Cohen pointed out earlier is we have so much resource going right now to media specialists and very little to instructional technology facilitators. Now, does this mean that we're going to suddenly get rid of all of our media specialists? No, but it might mean that we transition that role. And that transition means that those people are already there to do that job. They just have to have a different job to do going forward. So we're starting to think through ways to make sure that that happens, that rather than just adding more funds in, that we're thinking about where the current funds can be re reallocated. So Wednesday, we present the first version of the plan. And I say first version intentionally because the plan is an evolving document. We've had an incredible amount of input over the last several months from a lot of different stakeholders. We're going to continue to get input. It's also going to have to be uh, considered a draft because we're going to have to modify it based on the support that we get for moving the plan forward, the timeline, uh, the elements of the plan that resonate, the budget, things like that. Um, but the plan will go to the state board Wednesday, and it will be up for approval by them for moving forward and saying we get behind this document or not. Now, there's more steps that happen after that. But. I think, yeah. um, I think there's a requirement that um, it be presented to joint ed oversight, yes. um, which so we'll take what the board approves in partnership with the lieutenant governor's office, the Department of Public Instruction, um, get some feedback on that, bring in once we get the final numbers for the state budget, and then that will all go before joint ed oversight. And then we do what we do best is we'll be <laughs> back out on the road. Uh, we will be on the road all of September and part of October <laughs> sharing then the next step. Here's where we got. Here's the feedback we got from you guys. Here's the plan we came up with. What do you think? Mm -hmm.
I'll, I'll be glad to lead off and then let you guys chime in. I think an important piece of this is that, and I, I've gone back to this slide intentionally, that the transition to digital age learning is not about the transition to all digital all the time. So one of the things that our districts and our schools, the ones who have already been doing this for 10 to 12 years already know this, is for instance, when we think about uh, uh, early developmental reading, it's very important for those kids to have text in their hands and to have a book and to work through that type of process. So what we don't want to do is have uh, a district or a school go all digital all the time because what we'll end up is with is just what you're saying, is we're going to change the way that they develop and that's not something that we'd like for this to do. So that's why when I go back to this slide, I want to note that of the eight uh, digital age teaching and learning elements, five of them don't have anything to do with digital because part of this is just changing the way we think about uh, the learning and education and not about co wholly converting over. Now that's gonna be something that we're gonna have to watch going forward because as we've seen other districts across the state do this, some of them do go all in and some of them don't. And that's part of the importance of making sure that what we're learning at the school level and the, and the district level has a way to go out to the other districts. This is one of the things they don't talk to each other very much about and we want to have that conversation going. And I think as, that one of the things that we've really tried to do is start with um, best interests of the child, best interests of the teacher. You know, I, I was telling uh, folks today, I dropped my daughter off for her very first day of kindergarten today, and I would never ever want somebody from the Friday Institute telling that kindergarten teacher what she had to do in her classroom for grace, right? She knows best, the teacher knows best. I think what this is about is providing opportunities opportunities and resources for teachers as they need them, as they see fit for their kindergarten classrooms, um, and making sure that it's all schools in North Carolina have, a, have an equal opportunity and equal access so that, you know, what, what Grace Corn has access to at Root Elementary in Wake, that the exact, a child in Halifax County, an elementary school in Halifax County, has that same type of opportunity. Um, and I think the conversations that we can have and the recommendations that we've put in here around professional development go directly to what you're talking about, to making sure teachers understand what is developmentally appropriate for their students, both digitally, instructionally, and I think our trying to think about that as the whole child, I think, and also really engaging that idea that I talked a little bit earlier about, about parents, helping parents understand what's developmentally appropriate and what con and being able to have that tr more transparent opportunity to see what are my kids learning in their classroom because now they can go online and they can see what the teachers got on their website and that kind of that communication tool I think is a critical to make sure that, that we're that we're um, addressing needs as they arise instead of instead of waiting too long. So hopefully that helps. And I, let me just chime in. One other thing is uh, this got brought up with at the state board when right now we're piloting uh, virtual schools. And one of the big discussions when we were there were from all the state board members is, all right, we're just going to plop our kids in front of computers when they're at kindergarten. In fact, the state board, some of the members didn't even want uh, kindergarten through sixth grade being able to do the online education because they, they feared uh, the unknowns of what you do. And then what we did is we said, all right, I'm just using the virtual schools as examples. They came in and go, we customize this curriculum to each, each individual student. However, we are not going to sit there uh, at kindergarten and have them 100% of the day sit in front of a computer. In fact, we have a very detailed plan where about 10 to 20% of the time they're sitting there and the, the rest of the time they're with either their parent or their tutor to figure out their logistics. And I, I think that the same thing is going to happen with this as well. Uh, whenever we're on the road and we talk about the digital plan, parents always raise their hands. And I even had one parent and I uh, say, uh, my kids are going to get square eyes from from doing this, and or their and their eyes are going to get ruined. And we're just saying you know, this is we're giving them the platform, we're giving them the option. Some kids might need more attention on their iPad or whatever their device is than other kids, but they also might be moving at a faster rate at that grade level. So I really do think it's up to the school district to figure out what's best.